This is the video lecture on deductions from AGI. And in a previous video, we talked about the deductions for. So these are going to be those deductions that are classified as from adjusted gross income. Now, the deductions from AGI include three very specific areas. Number one, everyone is entitled to the personal exemption for themselves. So you're always going to get that. And, of course, that amount is going to vary from year to year. In addition to that, you also have the dependency exemptions. And, of course, in a previous video, we talked about the rules for claiming someone as a dependent. So you may or may not have anyone who qualifies, but those that do, you would definitely want to take those exemptions. But then the third part of it is either the standard or itemized deductions. Now, remember we said you're going to take the higher of the two. So you're going to take one or the other, whichever one is the highest. And remember, the amount of standard deduction that the person is entitled to depends upon their filing status. So if you're going to itemize, it means that you're going to have to come up with enough itemized deductions to figure out whether or not the person qualifies. In other words, if you can't come up with enough itemized deductions that it exceeds the standard deduction, then they're not going to itemize. So for the rest of this lecture, we're going to focus then on what the itemized deductions are. And of course, these are the ones that we may or may not be entitled to. We'll talk about some of the rules. And again, if we can come up with enough that it exceeds the standard deduction, then we're going to take advantage of these. So the major areas, there are five of them. You have medical, taxes, interest, charitable contributions, and finally, miscellaneous. So to talk about each one of these in greater detail, first of the five would be medical. Now, medical expenses are potentially an, a, an itemized deduction. Of course, in order to claim these medical deductions, we have to make sure that they qualify. So the initial three criteria, number one, these medical expenses must exceed 7.5% of the person's adjusted gross income. So the idea behind it is that the IRS wants us to be able to take advantage of these medical deductions, but only if they reach a certain level. So just because you had medical expenses doesn't mean you can deduct them. They have to have exceeded 7.5% of the AGI. And even then, you would only get to deduct the portion that actually exceeds that amount. So that's a criteria that has to be met. Secondly, the expenses have to have been paid by the taxpayer. It can't be something that was paid for by someone else. And it has to have been paid for in the current year. So that's the initial criteria on medical expenses. Now, some additional criteria. In order for it to actually qualify as a medical expense, it has to be the diagnosis and treatment of a disease. It has to be a true medical expense. So for example, you know, you could say that you're having chest pains that are stress related and in order to help with the stress you're going to go on a cruise. And you go on the cruise and it helps with stress and suddenly the chest pains go away. That's not a medical expense. It's not a legitimate expense that was paid for the diagnosis or treatment of a disease. So it has to be a legitimate expense. Also medical insurance. The premiums and the costs that we pay for that medical insurance, that is a deduction. Medications that we pay for. Capital improvements. For example, you might have to build a ramp that goes into your house to make your house handicapped accessible. Or you might have to, you know, widen the doorway. Or you might have to put in a swimming pool for aquatic therapy. So there are different things that you might have to do that would be considered a capital improvement to a home 
but it's being done for medical reasons. And that would be deducted at least up to the extent that it doesn't improve the value of the home. And then also travel and meals that are associated with medical visits, doctor's visits, and things like that. The second main area of itemized deduction would be taxes. And under taxes, you could take the deduction of your property tax as long as it's based on value. So property taxes on your home, property taxes on land, things like that. Also, you have the option of your state and local income taxes. And of course, that just depends on the state that you live in. Remember, we said some states and some local areas don't even have an income tax. But if they do, you could potentially take that deduction. And you also have the option, an either or option, of deducting your state sales taxes. So if you lived in a state where you felt that you had paid enough state sales taxes that it exceeded your state income tax, you could take that as a deduction. Of course, I would be careful of doing that because if you did take that deduction and you were unfortunate enough to be selected by the audit discriminant system, then you might have to come up with receipts to back that number up. So that's something to be uh, cognizant of. The next big area would be interest. And of course, home mortgage interest, as well as business interest. Those could be taken as itemized deductions. All the other forms of interest cannot. So for example, interest on a car loan, interest on a credit card, those types of uh, personal interest payments, those can't be taken. But home mortgage interest and business interest, that could be an itemized deduction. The next big area would be charitable contributions. And of course, we've talked about this before, and we said that the IRS has certain things that are social objectives. You know, why would they allow us to take a deduction for charitable contributions? Obviously, it is to encourage people to contribute to charity. Now, in order to take this, it must be a qualifying organization. So in other words, you couldn't just, you know, pick someone that you feel is in need of charity and give that person as an individual person money. It would be good of you to do that. It would be certainly a, a wonderful thing, but you couldn't take that as a deduction because there's too much potential for abuse. So it's only contributions to qualifying organizations, organizations that are uh, qualifying and rec recognized as a legitimate charity. And then when you contribute this charitable contribution, how are you going to make this contribution? Is it going to be cash? If it's cash, then that's going to be easy to document. You're going to get a receipt. You're going to have proof of the amount of money that you contributed, and it's going to be easy to calculate and document. The only time you really have to worry about it is if it's going to be a contribution of property. Now, if you're going to contribute property, you know, maybe you're going to give a piece of land to a hospital, or maybe you're going to donate a building to a public charity, something like that. Well, that's a property contribution. That's not a cash contribution. And if you're going to do that, that raises some questions. Because if you're going to donate property, how much do you deduct as a contribution? Do you use the cost of the property or do you use the value? Well, the rule is that you have to have had this property for more than a year. And if you've had it for more than a year, then you can deduct the fair market value of the property. Otherwise, if you've had it for less than a year, you're limited to just the cost of the property. So say you had some land and say that you've had it for 10 years and you paid $10,000 for it and now all of a sudden it's worth 20000 and you give it to a charity. Well, you could deduct the full 20000 the fair market value. But if you had that property for less than a year, you would only get to deduct the cost, the 10000 so that's the way we would do that if it's property. 
Otherwise, if it's cash, it's just the actual cash amount and it's easy to maintain. Now, if we're going to have some charitable contributions, there are also going to be some limits involved. There are three different limits. First of all, there's a 50% overall limit. That means that I could only deduct 50% of my AGI as a charitable contribution. Now, that doesn't mean that I couldn't actually make those contributions. It just means I couldn't deduct them. So, for example, if I had an AGI of $100,000, maybe I'm going to give more than $50,000 away to charity. I can do that, but I can't actually deduct any more than $50,000. I can't actually deduct any more than half of my AGI. Then we have another limit, and this has to do with property. If it's a property contribution and I give it to a public charity, it can't be any more than 30% of my AGI. If it's public property and I'm giving it to a private charity, then it can't be any more than 20%. So I only worry about those other limits kicking in if I'm giving property rather than cash. And then the final area of itemized deductions would be miscellaneous. In this area, there's a rule of 2%. These items must exceed 2% of AGI before they would be deductible. And these include things like employee-related expenses, the expenses of tax preparation or tax advice, investment expenses, and many others. That's not a, an exhaustive list of all the miscellaneous deductions, but at any rate, they must exceed 2% of AGI. So those are all the different areas of itemized deductions. But remember, as you calculate all these amounts, unless they exceed the standard deduction, then you're still going to take the standard because you're going to take the greater of standard or itemized.